Number one, from the National Academy of Sciences of the Ukraine, please applaud Dimitro Rumiantsev. Uh, when I was preparing for this speech, I began to realize just how varied my research might look. I do surface science, and I think that it's a part of experimental physics. But there is a problem with this definition. Because if you ask physicists about surface science, they will say they know nothing about it. Uh, for me, it started in my childhood. I dreamt of becoming a chemist. Chemistry is a really spectacular science. All these explosions, flasks and poisons. I'm 23 now, and I study chemical processes. But there is one exception. I study chemical processes as a physicist. So here is a photo of my equipment. And there are not any flask or at least one small explosion. Uh, you could say that it's quite large. And it's possible that some chemical stuff is located inside chamber. No. The chamber is almost empty. The size of my sample is about a few millimeters, moreover. It was set there about 20 years. Since then, my research group has published nine articles about it. So here's a good example what eight people could do to uh, together uh, during two decades, study processes on a 24 square millimeters of molybdenum. Why do we need such complicated, strange equipment to study chemistry? In classical, inorganic chemistry, everything is relatively simple. You take one component, for example, sodium, uh, then some other component, for example, water, mix them together, and as a result, you'll get an explosion. Uh, mechanisms of many reactions are not really straightforward. For example, addition of some third component could speed up or slow down a reaction, but the component by itself does not participate in it. Uh, in surface science, we study uh, chemical processes at fundamental atomic level. And it's strongly connected to technology, and I will show you a few examples. First is uh, Haber-Bosch process of ammonia production. It was invented about 100 years ago. It is still utilized in manufacture of fertilizer. It makes possible to provide food for a billion people, and the mechanism of this process was mainly explained by Nobel laureate Gerhard Ertel with surface science method. Another example is also connected to Gerhard Ertel research is carbon monoxide oxidation over platinum. Um, it's used in automotive catalytic converters and these converters decrease emission of such harmful compounds as carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, and hydrocarbons. The last case I will show you is connected to semiconductor industry. The heart of each PC is a CPU, is produced by thin layer deposition, and the method of surface science are applied in semiconductor industry to control adhesion and chemical composition of layers uh, because it strictly affects the uh, electronic properties and thus feasibility of a device. Uh, my research is not so practical yet. I study burning of beryllium metal in oxygen, but it's an inaccurate description because uh, I'm actually studying the oxidation of beryllium film on molybdenum, which is only few atoms thick. The main questions I get at conferences is how. How do you study an object which is only few atoms thick? 
I will tell you about two methods we use. First is electron spectroscopy. It's in some way similar to how we as people see objects uh, using our eyes. When you look on tomato, how do you understand that this is tomato rather than a potato? Uh, one of criteria you use is a color for object. If you delve into physics of this process, we could say that tomato reflects more electromagnetic wave in the red range. Uh, the interpretation of electron spectroscopy result is quite the same. We expose our sample with electrons of a certain range, get the energy spectrum of reflected electrons, and as you say that this is tomato, I could say that this is beryllium and this is beryllium oxide. But this information is not enough to perform research. Why? Because this is also a tomato. How do you understand it? Uh, you look on the object form. In our research, we need to define the atomic structure of surface, and energy diffraction is used for this purpose. Possibly you studied uh, diffraction in high school, but maybe this memory has faded in time. So, if one will illuminate two openings, instead of getting pictures of two openings, you will get the pattern of alternating light and dark bands. What is important here? The diffraction picture depends on openings parameters. In our experiment, we have diffraction of electrons on periodic atomic structure. And when we get such picture, I could say that probably our sample possess crystal uh, cubic structure. Let's talk about ongoing experiments which I am doing. For me, it's like cooking Ukrainian borscht. Uh, firstly, uh, you cook, sorry, uh, deposit beryllium on molybdenum. Uh, then you add a pinch of oxygen to the chamber. Uh, beryllium starts oxidizing, but the result is not really tasty. This means I could not publish result like this. Uh, we don't find any other structure on the surface, and also there is a mixture of beryllium, beryllium oxide. So we need to boil our dish, in our case, to anneal it up to 2,000 degrees. Uh, in this graph, uh, you could see what happens during annealing, but the most interesting occurrence appears at 1,100 Kelvin after evaporation of metallic beryllium. Uh, if you look on the structure of the surface, uh, you see that it's quite the same to clean molybdenum. So this is our potato. But if you check the chemical composition of the surface, you could see that there is beryllium oxide on the surface. So this is our tomato. This tomato potato riddle is like borscht. Uh, what is actually there? It means that beryllium oxide forms a epitaxial structure on the surface of molybdenum, uh, but we expect to understand the particular atomic structure and we are limited with our equipment, so we ask a computer physicist to help us out. Uh, they model our system in special software and obtain this pretty honeycomb structure, beryllium oxide 2D film, and we are the first in the world who synthesize it. Uh, you could compare it to graphene. It's quite the same, the main difference is that graphene is a free material and our sample, our system chemically bonded to molybdenum. Uh, it's possible that after a few decades it will be used in a smartphone, on in a car, but this is not really my concern at present. Thank you.